so I mean, I do have some things, you know, in the notes, and I and I thought I had some examples there, but um, but really. We have this, and across VR is band, across VL is high, across VC is low, across VL plus VC is notch. Now, really, to turn this into an op amp based circuit, and now I'm just going to turn it on its side. Really, you just have to put a buffer. Mm -hmm. Okay. And the thing is, is the because all of these are in series, the denominator is constant or, or the same. So omega naught is the same. And thus, um, for the high pass, right, you have an omega naught. For the low pass, you have an omega naught. The band, omega naught, and the notch, omega naught, are all the same. So once you choose your RL and Cs, Right, it's the same for all those four questions, and then you just have to um, manipulate where you're taking the output. So, if I wanted to do a high pass, oops, I would put the inductor here and bring that up there. If I wanted the notch, I would just take it from here, right. And then if I want the band, oops, well, it doesn't matter. I would just take it across the resistor. Okay. Uh, was that? Yeah, that's helpful. Uh, also on the homework, I believe the question asked specifically, how would you draw an op amp that is y of s is equal to h1 of s plus h2 of s times x of s using an ROC circuit. Um, the thing is, is I, I do have other things to talk about today. Um, and I don't mind questions, but usually they kind of got to come be, when is this homework due? Oh, it was the recent homework I passed already. Do tonight? All right. Then then I'm gonna have to to kind of I know that this is on the lab report, right? But um maybe you could uh email me that question. Yeah, no problem. Thank you. Yeah, and if I yeah, okay. Yeah, sorry, it's just um I did have something I wanted to review today. Um, and yeah, to address um, Nick's comment, right? Yeah, it, it gets harder. It's one thing, let's say, um, you know, in your introduction to circuits class, right? I give you all these values and you tell me what it does or, or what, you know. But now I'm saying I want to do something, create the circuit to make that happen. Oh, that's a lot harder. And that's harder for everybody. But you will um, learn how to do it. And that's, you know, that's the job as um, engineers. So, in fact, what you end up doing is you propose something to yourself. Oh, this, I want a low pass single pole filter with a gain of zero dB. You propose this to yourself. 
you come up with some values and then you analyze it to make sure that it will actually do what you thought it would do. So like 98 is more, it's introduction to circuit analysis, which is part of 110, which actually has design in it, all right? Um, so, um, I think office hours went pretty well this morning. Um, and thank you for those who came. Uh, your questions were pretty targeted, and I think I was able to get your main, your big question answered. Um, but what's coming out is, I think the last problem people would like to see that summarized a bit more. Now, um, sure, it's all in the notes and the videos, but it might be kind of hard to to go through. So let's just talk about high and low pass. And I'm going to leave out the phase for right now. OK. Now, um, you know, this is a high pass and that's a low pass. But what would I need you to hear you say or, or, or write about to tell me why it is or, or not, right? Because while it may be true, this is a high pass frequency, the magnitude of the frequency response of a high pass filter, because it is, right? That's kind of circular logic or you're using the definition for the definition, right? And so when I look at this, I say, you know, there's a kind of a cutoff frequencies, right? And these signals, are not attenuated and below that they are attenuated so lower frequencies are attenuated high frequencies are passed or not attenuated and the opposite is true for the low right at some point um signals not attenuated and then at some point signals Are. And so that's, um, and really that, sure, this is omega naught S plus omega naught, and it says that mathematically, but what does that really mean? How can you talk about that on a job interview, right? How can you think about this in an intuitive way? Because the math is important for analysis, but in design, you're kind of keeping it all in your head, okay? So um, now, what does this look like in the time domain? Now, we can take the inverse uh, Laplace and come up with the impulse responses. But let's um, think about the step response for a second, right? This is time, but that's 1 over s, right? And it'll and so just a quick kind of Bode top plot of the magnitude of one over S, right? S equals J omega, we get this, right? So now let's superimpose that um, first. on a high pass filter. Well, remember, we're in the S domain, so to find the output, you're just multiplying this times that. You don't have to do convolution. And so these low frequencies information, right, it's being attenuated, right? And here, Right, if I'm multiplying this together, the high frequency information is being attenuated, right? And so what are the implications is that if the 
high pass, right, attenuates high frequency, uh, low frequencies, right, it passes edges or it takes the derivative, right, sharpens things, right, where the low pass, right, um, smooths edges, all right? So if I were to do the step response of a low pass filter, right, it's gonna smooth the edge, and a high pass, it's gonna detect the edge, right? That's high and that's low. So when you saw that shape, really, That's all you really needed to know because that's the step response. Now, sure, this is a, a ramp response, a ramp input, right? But um, so then all you need to do is say, well, it's a first order filter, right? And it's going to take five tau to get where you're going. Well, um, let's say you read. 20 hertz, right? Then omega naught would equal 2 pi 20 hertz. That would mean tau equals 1 over that. And this is in the millisecond range. And so I'd be looking for something that took like tens of milliseconds to rise up, right? where um, the other one was like at two hertz or one hertz, right? And that took, you know, a much longer time. And so that's answering the question, you know, getting the right one, right, high or low, and then making sure that in the, if you, once you've got high and low, that you're getting the right one. And then kind of describing, you know, this idea of rounding, edge detection, right? That's how you can tell that one thing is a, a low pass response and one thing is a high pass. Saying, yes, I, I know that that's the step response of a high pass filter, but what are the features that make it that, okay? All right. Now, today we're going to talk about gain bandwidth. All right. And just like before, we were talking about a signal flow graph where we had a summer and some transfer function. Right? And we were, you know, I think we had done things like one over S. Right, and we were able to get high and low pass and all these um, responses. But the thing is, is this part right here is in fact an op amp as well, all by itself, right? Because think about it. I have plus minus V out equals the difference, right, times the open loop gain. Now in 98, we let that open loop gain go to infinity, right? But now we've seen this in lab already, maybe a bit prematurely, but the open loop gain has, is a function of frequency. And some interesting things can happen when you put in a feedback network. Now, let me just draw the circuit, right? Okay. 
here's the summer. Inside is the transfer function. And for just a non-inverting amplifier, right, I have my out. And that beta, well, that's just a voltage division, right? V minus equals V out. Sure, it's coming out of an op amp, but it's still just a voltage source. It depends on V in, but ideally, right, an op amp is an ideal voltage source. So we assume that until we don't, until we find out that it doesn't work. Then we have a voltage division here, right? And um, that's not so much about today, but that beta, right, is R1 plus R2. And when we uh, do our signal flow analysis, we come up with an equation for V out versus V in with H of S in it. And if we let this go to infinity, like an ideal op amp, we get the non-inverting response. Now, we're gonna find that, 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 that we cannot always say the open, this open loop gain is infinite. And what I thought is, It'd be better to just show some things in LT spice. Beta is the voltage division, okay? And in, now the thing is, is these can be resistors, capacitors, inductors. They can even, this feedback can be even be other op amp circuits. But um, yeah, that's just the feedback. This is more like the overview rather than, you know, kind of how to do the homework. So what we have here is an op amp and one side is connected to ground and the other side is connected to an input and there's no feedback here. And a lot of textbooks will tell you that because it's ideal and the resistance is infinite, no current can flow. That means these two nodes have to be equal to each other. Well, that's patently incorrect because even though it's tied to ground, you could think of that as a voltage source setting it to, to zero volts, right? And so when you have two voltage sources, they're gonna set that node to whatever that voltage source is. So let's see what that looks like when we, uh, So, um, so if you didn't look at these numbers, you'd probably would just say, that's a low pass filter. And the cutoff frequency is somewhere around a Hertz, but the phase goes from zero to minus 90. Oh, maybe something's going on here, but um, you can see that this has a 20 dB slope. And that's because in this region, from the narrow focus I've shown you, this is a first order low pass filter. That's all, <laughs> um, that's all that it is. Oh, hi Bradley. Um, no, ground is zero volts. What I'm saying is ground is really a voltage supply setting that node to zero volts. I'm trying to help you um, 
unlearn some things from the textbook, all right? Now, the thing is, is that the gain here is 120 dB, right? So that's, um, which is pretty good for an op amp, but it's not infinite, right? This right here is that open loop gain at, at at what is close to zero hertz. Now, if I was testing this, right, 10 millihertz, I'd have to go for 100 seconds just to get one peak to peak, right? Um, so it's kind of hard to measure it like that. The real circuit to measure this isn't like what I've shown in LT Spice. It's, a, it's another thing, all right? But really, we can take that op amp, and as long as the transfer function we want is below here, then the op amp is acting ideal. So let's look at one. This is a non-inverting gain stage with a gain of one, right? Where is that going to work? So I'm going to get rid of so notice how the gain on the original V out, the op amp with no feedback, it's very large. And then here it's zero, right? So I'm just going to delete this, or I'm going to do two at a plot plane. And what you can see is that zero dB is a gain of one, and it's a gain of one you know all the way out to you know almost a hundred kilohertz, okay and okay. So rather than give you all these conditions, um, when it work, won't work, the data sheet will tell you this point, and it will tell, give you a different point called the gain bandwidth, which is when the gain of the op amp with no feedback is one or zero dB. So the Gain bandwidth of this op amp is 300 kilohertz, okay? Because it's at about zero. And notice, it's it looks just like a low pass first, you know, first order low pass filter, right up until about then. Then you can see the phase start to change, right? But um, if you want to see a little more, wait a second. All right now you can actually see another breakpoint, and so in fact it's a, at least a second order, but in fact it's even more than that because you can see the phase going um, way past minus 180. Now, really, you might think, why tell me this point when I have all that information, right? Or, you know, my test equipment doesn't go up to 200 megahertz or 500, right? This, this pole out here, right, this 10 megahertz pole, I'm not even going to see that. Well, it turns out that when you put this in a feedback loop, strange things can happen. So let's do this one first.
All right. In this case, acts like a buffer, and then the frequency goes down. I mean, the magnitude goes down and the phase is going down, but this is actually pretty well behaved. All right. The op amp at some point just doesn't have enough gain. And so it stops working at about the gain bandwidth. Let's look at different op amp. Here, kind of, you know, here it's flat. It's a first order. Then something, it kind of goes up and comes down and then goes up and comes down. These are actually zeros that are, they're zeros and they're put there for a reason. But um, this class isn't about that. It's just about at high frequencies, you can have things going on in the op amp that affect you at low frequencies. So, what I want to do is Okay. So here looks like the step response of a low pass filter, right? Ideally, it would be a rectangle function if this was an ideal op amp, right? It would just go up instantaneously, but no, it takes some time to, to rise and some time to fall. And that would correspond to the gain, to that um, gain bandwidth, right? But now with this other op amp, the 1632, Notice it's a little faster, right? But it's oscillating. Okay. Let's go back to the Bodhi plot. So notice how, in this case, even though I've put this op amp with a feedback loop, right, I can see a break point, I can kind of see a break point, other things are going on. But what's, um, what you'll be able to tell at the end of the semester is that these poles are all still real, and so you're not going to get oscillate behavior that oscillates. But what you see here is by putting this in, in a feedback loop, I'm getting a peak. And you'll find out later in the class that that means I have complex poles. Where did those complex poles come from? Well, what happens is you can see these and there's no peaking in the Bode plot. And that means all the poles are real, right? Multiple poles, but they're still real, just kind of like exam one. And what happens is when I put them in the feedback loop, okay, in this case, beta would be one, it can change these poles and turn real poles into complex poles that even though this, let's go back to, So even though those poles, some of those extra poles are, you know, way past the megahertz, right? Even simulating something much slower than that, it can pop out in the step response and you can see this ringing. So you might not be able to measure 
a megahertz or 500 megahertz pole, but you can certainly see um, the effects of it at lower frequencies. And that, the fancy term for these oscillations is called ringing. All right. Now that's an overview of everything of what we need to do with gain bandwidth. Hey, um, Professor, I have a quick question. Um, I'm kind of confused about how you can have like these poles and such if like they're like the examples you were giving didn't have like any kind of filter in front of or part of the op amp. I just like didn't really understand how we can have those poles just with only an op amp. Okay. Um, that's really the next bit. Okay. And I'm going to try to explain it. Um, without making you take MADI 153, EE 128, and EE 124. Okay. Sounds good. <laughs> so um, inside that op amp are things called transistors. I'm just kind of making this up. Um, it's not the style I use, but you have resistors, you have transistors that set up currents and other transistors. And these are the things that actually are the inside of an op amp. Now the thing about a transistor is that it has a current and um, it has like a scale factor and it can have, this is one current relationship. And so it's a voltage controlled current source. And again, no capacitances, but a transistor, right? It can turn current off and it can turn current on. And so what that means is I have two diodes back to back, right? And if you remember diodes, nothing flows one way and something flows the other. But in this case, this is forward bias, that's reversed, it's blocked. In this case, if I put a positive voltage here, right, it passes and then it's blocked here. And then this VG is manipulating the semiconductor um, to allow current to flow. Now this will not work. Um, like if I put two diodes and then connect the resistor, you're not gonna get a transistor. This is really happening inside the device, all right? But what you get is this kind of nothing flows. These are breakdown points, but in this region, we're saying no current flows. And to get that to happen, right, Transistors need two diodes, minimum. Diodes are made out of N and P material, okay? And one side is mostly electrons and the other ones are, are holes. Now, everything in fact is really an electron, right? But Inside a semiconductor, if I put an electric field and the electron goes in the opposite direction it should, well then you can kind of say it's acting like a positive charge. And what happens is when you put these two materials together, they move toward each other and then kind of annihilate each other so that you get an insulator. And so you can just think of this as really kind of like a piece of metal and a piece of metal separated by an insulator. Well, that is a capacitor. And so there's all these capacitances in all these transistors. All 
right? And what they do is actually, you don't really want those capacitors there, but they're there. And they make the circuit oscillate. And what I mean is, we've had everything over here, right? Might have been complex, because that means we get e to the t alpha. If I had a pole over here, I'd get e to the plus t alpha, and I'd get exponential increase rather than our exponential decays, and nothing would work. And so what you end up doing is um, putting a big capacitor in between these two nodes and then turning the op amp into some uncontrollable system into a low pass filter with a pole on the left hand side. Now, what I was just talking about, this here is actually later on in control theory, but really it's all the same thing. I'm talking about an op amp out of control, or I'm talking about, you know, a car out of control or any control system. Okay. And, and op amps tend to be the simplest control systems you can work on because you can test them so easily with electronics. All right. That might have been a bit much. All right. But really, in order to have op amps, you need to be able to control current. It needs to flow when you want it to flow, not when it feels like it. The only way that happens is with two back to back diodes. Diodes are made out of opposite semiconductors. If you don't, well, you don't have a diode. So when you have two opposing semiconductor types, they form an insulator. And if you have two kind, if you have positive elect, if you have positive and negative charge separated by an insulator, that's a capacitor. These capacitors are unwanted. They're called parasitic, but you can make it in control. You can get exponential decrease by adding this capacitor inside the chip. Okay. So, you know, Maddie 153 and 128, 122 and 124, you're going to learn more and more about the inside of the op amp as we go along. But you can uh, see what's happening and you can design for gain bandwidth before you actually design what's on the inside of an op amp, right? You, you can determine when your buffer is not going to work just by reading a data sheet. Okay? How was that? Too much? Oh, that's good. Thank you. I'm sure your brain's not full. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, here's, here's the thing. Um, some people like to know where every electron is going before they look at the system. And some people, no, I, I, they want to see the system. And then if they want the detail, then they want to go find it, but not beforehand. And the way electrical engineering used to be taught was you took all the physics, you looked at the inside of the op amp before you even, and then at the very end, they'd say, oh, here's an inverting op amp. By that point, years have gone by and you have forgotten what was going on on the inside, all right? But right now, you guys can design simple low pass filters, high pass filters with a gain stage, all right? I mean, um, you don't really have to know how internal combustion works to be able to drive a car, right? In fact, if you're thinking about that as you're driving, you might actually cause an accident. Okay. So here we have a data sheet. And we can actually 
recreate the Bode plot from the data sheet. Things that we're looking for today are the open loop gain. And here are the conditions, right? V out between plus or minus 10 volts. That kind of means that your power supplies are, you know, plus or minus 10 volts. Here's the um, resistance that it's driving, 2K, and you get 100 here, right, or 80. And if you're driving 10K, you can, your gain is higher. All right, but notice these values in bold are the minimum, but then these values are what they call typical. And the thing is, is this is the value they sell you. Hey, you're gonna, um, you know, this op amp has a certain level of gain, but these bolded values, are the only things that they're actually guaranteeing. So if you go and center your design around this number here and it's not working, and it turns out because you got a bunch of op amps at 300, you're kind of out of luck. Now, these gains, just to point out, 300 and 180 aren't the raw gain. They're actually volt divided by millivolt. So let's take 80. So if I want to find the, you know, what, what is the open loop gain as it approaches DC? 20 times log 80 divided by 1 e to the minus 3 because it was 80 per milli. So um, 98 dB, I'm just gonna call it 100. Okay, that gives me now, Bode plots, right, because it's logarithmic, can never go to zero hertz, but you can get close. Now, what, I need another thing, and I need the gain bandwidth. Frequency response. Unity gain, small signal, right? And what that is telling me, that's another definition of gain bandwidth. Gain bandwidth unity gain, right? Or zero dB. So It's the frequency at which the gain equals one. So here they're saying it's 0.7 minimum and one typical, all right? I'm just gonna use one just because it's easier. Uh, what is it? Okay, so it's one, what is it? One megahertz. All right, so somewhere out here at, at one megahertz, I'm zero dB. That's 100 dB. Forgiving the, let's say, the axis, right? Twenty dB per decade. 
And so now you you can find that intersection and you can actually come up with um, some transfer function, all right? But the, so, and the assumption is that here, right, it's some gain over S and here it's just constant. Well, these are the asymptotic Bode plots, right? Now, sure, some things are going on over here, right? But in this range, it's acting very much just like a first order low pass filter, all right? Now, with those two things, now you know that really, In here is your safe space to design. All right. So let's make a So omega naught is actually two pi, right? And I'm actually on a F frequency axis here. Anyway, so if the gain is 10, that's what? 20 dB. If this is one megahertz and the cutoff frequency is a kilohertz, right? I can draw something like this. And notice, first order low pass filter, first order low pass filter, they're not gonna intersect, the slopes are the same. And so that's kind of your safe range that you can design. Now sure, if I have another break here, sharper, eventually these two lines are gonna connect. And so your safe range is actually limited, all right? This is the op amp, right? Um, what if I want a high pass filter? Okay. All right, I'm below, I'm safe. I'm below, I'm safe. Oops. Not safe, right? That op amp right, will limit the frequencies that are being passed. And you might think, oh, well, that's obvious from a high pass because it's supposed to pass, you know, infinitely high frequencies, and you can see that it's attenuating high frequencies, so that won't work out. However, this can even happen with a, a low pass filter, where let's say I have this gain here, but what if I try to put my cutoff frequency out here. Well, the op amp is limiting it to here. And so no matter what your R and C values are, the op amp will limit it. All right.
Here's my op amp configuration. Let me draw it in a signal flow graph. That's my HS, okay? I'm just gonna switch colors. So V out is going to equal V in times H of S. It will also equal V out, in this case, beta. It's coming in on the minus side, so it's subtracted. And then we have um, our transfer function of the op amp. Solving for the transfer function, We get this. Let's call that omega of the op amp. Okay. So H of S is this. So I have gain that's my HS Here's my HS again. I'm going to multiply this through, right? So I'll get S plus so the cutoff frequency of the op amp, but then that's going to cancel out in this term, right? Now, when will this act like an ideal op amp, right? We usually say when the gain goes to infinity, right? But here's the term, right? If this was the only thing here, I would have the gains would cancel the cutoff frequencies would cancel, right? And so what I can write is if the magnitude of this is much less than this, right? So think about it. If this is a lot bigger than the magnitude of this, that drops out. I'm left with this. These cancel. I have one over beta.
And so the transfer function becomes or reduces to the gain of a non-inverting op amp. That's, and so you can come up with, if you set S equal to J omega, you can solve for this frequency. But if I look at this plot, right, I can do it intuitively and say, well, if I have a gain of 20, right, I'll be able to go out here. And as soon as I hit that, that's my limit. Now, really, it, it, in reality, it'll do something, a roll off here. All right, let's call that 20. If I have 40, that'll be my limit, All right? And so on, and so on. And so in this example, this was 100 dB. I can't go over 100 dB, I have to be below. But notice the higher the gain, the lower the range of frequency that this circuit will work at. And so really, if you look at a data sheet and you look at the open loop gain, that kind of is telling you what your maximum DC gain will be and then find the gain bandwidth and you can just kind of carve out where your usable space is. So if you have this Bode plot, right, rather than the data sheet, well, what's the DC gain? Well, we can never go to zero, but one milli is pretty close. And I can read it right off the data sheet here. What's the gain bandwidth? Well, here's zero dB, and it's coming in at a megahertz. So in this plot, right, it doesn't even really matter what that number is. But between here and here, right, there's no frequency response. I mean, it, it doesn't change with frequency. So it's acting, H of S is just kind of equal to some open loop constant, right? Now, From here to here, because there's a DC passing part and an attenuation part, it acts like a low pass, that's the model. Between here and here, it's a low pass. Between here and here, it's just a constant, right? And then between here and here, it's second order, right? I see a break, I see a break, right? So it's got to be second order. 
Now, where does this behave like an ideal integrator? Well, an ideal integrator is some number over s, right? So where do we get that? And so in 98, we kind of were here and we set this equal to infinity, right? But now as time's going on, we need to know where we're at because sometimes all you need is this to model it properly. Sometimes you need to model things properly here and sometimes you need the whole thing to model it properly or at least to explain what's going on. And what can happen is, is that these two real poles and a feedback network can make a complex pole. And so a step response will uh, have an oscillation that you might not want. All right. So that's all that that is, is that, you know, the whole thing is a second order. Up to here is a first order, right? Up to here is just DC. And here it's just an integrator, but nowhere is it actually an ideal op amp because I'd have to take 20 log of infinity and plot that flat out and you can't do that. So there's nowhere that it's a, um, where does it act like an ideal op amp? Nowhere, it's not. Here, I kind of, you can, um, I kind of showed you already how to do that. Um, I've hinted at this, but we need to do more detail. And the, the rest of it would be um, kind of going over this, like, you know, concrete examples. So really the first thing is to use that data sheet to find out where you can operate, right? That means you need to know what the gain bandwidth is, is at zero dB. And you need to know this point. And with those two things, you can get your safe range, right? Then, um, another task is, I have a more complete picture of what's going on in the op amp and, um, Right. So if you remember from 98, right, you have an RLC circuit and in some conditions it, you'll have uh, two separate poles that's overdamped to repeated, uh, a pair of repeated poles that's critically damped and then a pair of complex poles which is um, underdamped, right? And so, but once you have R, L, and C, unless you have a way of changing these, once it's set, it's set. But here's the thing, here I have two real poles and depending on how I use it, I can get complex poles, right? 
So determining the conditions under which that, that'll happen, right? That's kind of like another task. All right. And then, yeah, understanding that really, this is our op amp model, right? And that you can have AV and it can be DC. You can have AV divided by S. That's an integrator. AV omega naught. That's a low pass. You can have a second order. And then when you look at these Bode plots, right, you can have um, even higher than second order. Now the trick isn't really to be able to, I, all I want to do I want to make a non-inverting amplifier, right? The trick isn't to now insert these into your equation. The trick is to use this information so that you know when is this acting like a non-inverting amplifier, right? And it, and it comes right down to an ideal op amp where your open loop gain equals infinity. Well, it doesn't equal infinity, but if my tr but if the transfer function that I'm trying to do is several orders of magnitude below, well then open loop gain is acting like infinity in that case. It's just at some point it will stop working. So like I said before, um, on Wednesday, we will go over um, concrete examples of this. But I'll uh, throw it open to questions right now. So the data sheet I mean the data sheet gives other information but it gives you kind of the open loop gain at DC so it's giving you this point then it gives you gain bandwidth which is at this point. The way you come up with an approximation of the transfer function is you do an asymptotic Bode plot. Where here, that's, I'm just going to assume that's DC forever. All right, I'm going to assume, right, that this is some function over S forever, right? But then the, the true transfer function is the combination of these things and you can get an estimate for this all right but really you know the gain bandwidth is there you know what this is here and you just kind of keep below now the reason why lt uh linear technology and analog devices have these um have this tool is that the data sheet doesn't convey everything, 
you might want to know. It doesn't convey that high frequency information. But if you do a Bode plot, you can see what's going on. And you can see that for one op amp, the buffer doesn't ring. It just stops working at a particular frequency. The other buffer, the frequency it works at is higher, but it has a ringing. This, these, this thing here, this action here, isn't really in the data sheet. That comes out from the simulation tool. Hey, um, Karan and Alex, I, I don't know what the mine is too. Maybe that, um, maybe you got your answer, but I, I don't understand the question. <laughs> ah, <laughs> oh, that was my, all right. I even forgot my own joke. Okay. Um, thanks, Matthew. So, um, yeah, maybe our brains are a bit full. But really, once you see that almost everything we're going to be doing, you're going to have a summer, some kind of transfer function here, and, uh, and a transfer function here, this is going to be going on and on and on again for the whole uh, up to the second midterm. Today, we just kept this as a constant, beta equal a voltage division, right? But um, for the DF1, H of S was kind of like A1 over S, and then we fed it back with a minus one into the summer, right? And then we had another stage, and then we had a feedback, and another stage and a feedback. So really, um, this is an integrator, and inside that integrator is an op amp, which has its own transfer function. But really, it's all the same thing. Okay. Well, I'll let you all go. Have fun in 112.